I think that like knowledge is power and I guess researching, reading and studying the history of what came before is so important. Um, and, and looking back and re respecting those who did it before and have an understanding of the traditions and, and history of whether it be cooking styles and cuisines and techniques or chefs that, that, that sort of came before. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The impact that wine and service can have on a dining experience is just as important, if not more so, than the food itself. Great hospitality venues are the sum of many parts, but how do you create world-class experiences that cater for just about anybody? James Spreadbury is one of Australia's finest front-of-house professionals. James, how are you? Very well, Huck. How are you? I'm good. It's great to get you on the show. We've just caught you before you bought a plane to Europe. Yeah, that's right. I'm heading out to Copenhagen tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad we managed to catch you. You've um, you're a bit of a globe trotter. Worked in some incredible places all around the globe. Where where are you? About, where are you at the moment? You are you in South Australia? Yeah, right now I'm back in Adelaide, um, which is my I guess you could call it. Yeah, it's my hometown or where I grew up. Um, and we yeah we arrived back here um, in March 22. Um, so it's just, just on two years that I've been home uh, in Australia from Copenhagen. You spent a lot of time uh, in Copenhagen, which we'll get into, particularly with Noma. Um, you're heading over there at the moment. What, what are the plans at the moment? Oh, um, good question. I think that um, we got <laughs> – now I'm going to put it out there. I mean, we, we sort of – my kids were born over there. My wife is Norwegian. We got, um, you know, quite used to living in, in, in Europe and Copenhagen. I spent 13 years there, um, which was, of course, one of the sort of biggest, most important parts of my life and career, um, having kids, getting married, working where I was working. Um, coming home for various reasons has been fantastic, but there was always um, a plan that we may head back to Europe at some point. And uh, I guess the reason why it's happening now is that um, an offer, an interesting offer came up, which, you know, together as a family, we decided that we'd take on. Wow. That sounds extraordinary. Can't wait to see what that is. Um, you've, you've worked in some pretty incredible establishments, um, which I want to get into at some stage. And in front of house is such an important aspect of the dining experience. Um, but take, take us back to when you were young. You mentioned Adelaide being your hometown. Where, whereabouts did you grow up and what sort of role did food play? I grew up in an area called Belair and Blackwood, which is in the foothills of Adelaide. Um, and I mean, I was born in Brisbane, but we moved over here when I was two years old and if food was quite important in our family, we grew up with a beach house on the York Peninsula, which is about two hours from here. And probably some of the strongest first memories I have is going up there and, you know, there was a couple of things. There was this tradition that we would have with the parents, with my parents that, you know, we'd get there on a Friday night after school and, you know, they would always make spaghetti bolognese and it was just this thing that we would always do and um, it was a time when I just remember food starting to become very important. Growing up there as well, fishing um, and always with my cousins. I had a big, big group of cousins and we would always go out there together. We had a very strong family and... Um, you know, fishing every day to try and catch the quota to be enough to feed us all for dinner and, you know, learning from my older cousins how to fill it and spearfish and things like that was just, yeah, it, it sort of had a big impact. And then mum and dad were, you know, back then in the, I guess, late 80s, it was funny. They were sort of like, they weren't involved in food, but they always took time to, you know, organize themselves like special treats, like, you know, fresh oysters and uh, big prawns. And, you know, mum would sit there peeling the prawns and feed them to us. And um, little things like that. There was always this feeling that, you know, there was, there was special occasion around food in those types of moments. And then they would go out of their way to like, I guess, you know, we weren't a wealthy family, but they would find times that were important to like, I guess, spend a bit of money on those types of items and things like that. When did you sort of first get an interest uh, with a potential career in, in the food industry? 
it all sort of came through, I guess, my schooling situation. Um, I mean, beyond that, like I said, there was this interest in food and um, I guess also sort of the way that our household was a very open house with a lot of our friends. It was a very social house. Um, Mum and dad were very open to always having friends over and it was a bit of a drop-in centre for for me and my brother's friends. Um, and with school, it wasn't necessarily my fondest um, time. I, I was a little bit... Um, for various reasons, like non-authoritarian and, you know, I, I sort of struggled with it in the beginning um, until eventually we, we sort of, I moved schools a couple of times and we found a school that there was some incredible teachers that had a really good effect on me. Um, and eventually one of them in particular who was, I guess, teaching a, a sort of a hospitality and food focused uh, class. And that's where what piqued my interest. She sort of very much took me under her wing and I guess understood me as a young person and where I was coming from and recommended that I think about this as a, as a, as a career. Um, and from there, various things happened. I, I got my first job working in a restaurant and I fell in love with it. I had a couple of people within that who, who very much also took me under their wing and show me that there was there was just far much more to it, and it was such a, a, a passionate industry, and not just a job. Um, and then I applied and went into doing uh, sort of hospitality and hotel management at the the TAFE here called Regency TAFE. There's like a a local hospitality school, and then there's an extension of the European Le Cordon Bleu version. So I went and did that for a few years. Um, but I think that most of what I learned was on the job with the people that took me under their wing. And it just became this, um, you know, it was just such a passion. It, be it became something that was more than a job to me. I just became so enthralled by everything around it. As you sort of built your career, tell us a little bit about some of the venues and people that you worked at that sort of gave you the um, the skills and the passion for the front of house. I think that um, – my first role working for a group here called um, the Spa Group, um, and he, the late Bill Spa, was within Adelaide for a while. Um, he was a bit of a kingpin in the hospitality industry here. He had quite a few venues, including a hotel or two hotels, I think. Um, and my career started, um, funnily enough, at a restaurant that was local to us called Windy Point Restaurant, which back then was um, it was sort of like a you know, a fine dining special occasion restaurant with a view um, and, and I started there and I was lucky that there was a few people there that I, I, I guess saw potential in me and spent a lot of time and energy training me and taking me under their wing and opening special bottles for me to taste and, and things like that I have a lot of strong memories of. And then as I said, I just, I started to like read a lot. I, I became, you know, so interested in picking up every new issue of Gourmet Traveller and buying books and uh, traveling interstate to go and eat at restaurants that I'd heard about. Um, and, you know, I think that that started to have a really big impact on me. Um, from there, I went backpacking in 2006 for an entire year. So I sort of left that restaurant and went away. And um, that was also an incredible experience, just a sort of life experience, <laughs> let loose and sort of have no plans for a year and just see where life would take me. Um, when I came back, I ended up working in McLaren Vale here, uh, running a winery restaurant, which was also incredible because I was sort of given the opportunity to take over and run this restaurant um, with very little constraints. So it was a good sort of practice. It wasn't my own money. Um, they, they had enough, you know what I mean? It was, uh, it was a way for me to sort of make all the shots as a young person and, and, and take on this sort of, uh, restaurant. I remember, um, back then, you know, um, we sort of won one of these big awards, which it didn't really mean anything, but it was the best restaurant in a winery award for one of these local award things. And it sort of gave me a taste of like, wow, this is amazing, you know, to like get that sort of accolade and, um, <laughs> it was it was a good good memory. Well, what was Adelaide and South Australia like in a hospitality sense in those days? I would say very strong. Um, you know, Adelaide's always had a, a, a fantastic uh, food scene with its proximity to the regions. Um, 
you know, it's a, it's a place where people love to go to the regions, having the, the, the Barossa, McLaren Vale, the Adelaide Hills, and even further a little on from Clare. Um, so I think that, that that very, very close and rich wine industry here uh, had a big effect on uh, contributing to that. And obviously there's a long history here of, um, you know, incredibly, um, you know, iconic uh, people within our food industry, such as you know Chong Lu and Maggie and um, Stephanie uh, and people like that. So, yeah, um, I think it was a very rich, rich culture here. You've spent um, a large portion of your career overseas. Um, what was it like for you leaving um, Adelaide and immersing yourself globally? Well, obviously, it was um, huge. Uh, one of the the biggest sort of experiences of my life I, I guess growing up here and uh, looking afar both from South Australia like looking towards restaurants uh, interstate that I found so inspiring and exciting and then obviously looking afar to Europe these restaurants that were almost mythical um, back then um, and I guess even as a front of house person not coming from the, a, a kitchen background, I sort of just started to get this, you know, f- huge fascination with the the industry afar and what was going on over there. So I um, decided after backpacking and coming home that uh, I wanted to go and experience it for myself. I wanted to go and work somewhere amongst the world's, the sort of the world's best in a Michelin star restaurant and, you know, see where I could take my career. So I left in 2008. Um, and then originally I had a lot of ideas of different places I would like to work. Um, even thing, a place like, you know, Muggeritz, for instance, hearing about someone like, you know, an Aussie expat, like, you know, Dan that worked there um, was an inspiring story to me. Um, and um, then places like the Fat Duck or even somewhere like Le Gavroche in London, I, I had this interest to sort of go somewhere very classical and learn. Um, but <laughs> um, my, as I said, my, my wife was Norwegian and there was this Scandinavian connection and I did a bit of research and up popped this sort of little up and coming restaurant, which seemed to be doing things very differently um, and started to make uh, a bit of noise. And I just found it extremely fascinating. So I decided, well, I'm going to move to Copenhagen. And I did. (laughs) (laughs) Well, tell us about getting the gig at Noma and what what it was like for you compared to what you were used to in a hospitality sense. Um, Basically what I did, well... (laughs) I was too nervous to apply for a job before I left because I thought that if I got no response or a negative response, then I'd say, oh, screw it. I'm not going to go. So I decided to, you know, rent my house out, pack up my things and quit my job and leave um, and just see what would happen. Um, When I arrived in Copenhagen, uh, I basically rode around the city, rode around the city, dropping my my CV into a whole bunch of places. Um, In the beginning, I remember rocking up at Noma and all the staff were sitting out the front um, having like staff break, drinking coffee and um, dropping my resume in and they sort of looked at it and were like, where are you from? And gave me these weird looks and, um, you know, back then Copenhagen definitely wasn't as an international uh, as as it is now, especially within the hospitality industry. Um, but, yeah, I, I actually wound up, first of all, getting a job with another restaurant, Geranium. Um, which of course now has also come a long way and is well known, but this was in their original location. Um, unfortunately, I joined them and uh, that was, you know, a super exciting experience also. It was my first sort of foray into like working at that level. And um, But they went bankrupt after six weeks of me being there. Um, so basically myself and the entire team at that point we all rode our bikes over to the, I guess, what is the local union in, in, in Denmark to try to figure out what do we do now that we all don't have jobs. Um, and <laughs> it was a bit of a mess, but funnily enough, I was sitting in the waiting room uh, waiting to speak to someone and my phone called, one of my the little old Nokia phone called and 
it was Noma. It was on the same day. And just coincidentally, they called and said, hey, um, we actually have the potential for you to come and do a trial shift. So um, off I went and, um, yeah, the rest is history. I guess <laughs> that's extraordinary. Um, what what was Noma like that sort of back then compared to sort of what it became? I mean, it was um, it was in a very interesting stage of, um, of of building and discovering itself. It was in a very very hungry stage. Um, it was an extremely intense place to be. Uh, it was always moving and pushing, and I guess it was with the addition of the fact that it was doing something that was so new and groundbreaking. Um, uh, there was also this level of, um, you know, this feeling of having to prove itself or having to prove the movement and what it was doing. Um, because there was, it did come with, I guess, a lot of criticism for more classic approached um, media or journalists because it was so new. And I guess it was a part of, being a part of that time where it was building and people were starting to understand what it was that was going on there. My, um, I guess the thing that drew me in was of course the creativity of the food, but the approach to service and hospitality. And, you know, I think that the level of involvement that Renee had, um, in really worrying and caring about how guests were taken care of just as much as what was going on in the kitchen, was it was a huge impact and I think something that you know although uh, you know there was a lot of high pressure and it was very intense times it was also something that brought us together. Well, you worked your way all the way up to service director of NOMA. Um, how much did you change and how much did your approach to hospitality change over that time there? I think that it just refined it. I mean I, I, I think that I already had I mean I at least already had a foundation where I understood, you know, the basics and, and of, of how important it was to, you know, to take care of guests and how important that was as a part of the dining experience. But I guess it was just put on turbocharge there. Um, and with the types of, you know, guests that you would have coming and the amount of pressure, the, the, the traveling food people and the traveling, um, you know, industry people that would come and visit. Um, it was, it was, you know, nerve wracking serving, uh, some of the iconic world, you know, people of, of gastronomy. Um, you know, so you really just had this feeling like every day was, um, <laughs> you, you couldn't sort of rock up to work uh, a little half assed. It was, it was full, ch full charge every day. Do, do you have any stories over that time that really stand out for you or fond memories of, of a moment that sort of captured your time at Noma? Oh, I mean, 13 years, it's, there's just so many. Um, I think that, like I said, having the, having the opportunity as a young person to have in your dining room, you know, people like Michel Bra and Ferran Adria and, um, Heston and, you know, serving people like this as a young person was terrifying, but also extremely in inspiring. Um, and things like, I guess in those early days, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say that it wasn't extremely exciting to be a part of that sort of early 50 best experience and, and sort of winning those accolades and, and traveling to London as a team. We would always go as a big group and to sort of, especially the thing for me was beyond obviously that amazing feeling of, you know, being recognized but uh, as, as a team, but it was also just the opportunity to meet and network and mingle with, you know, sort of su such a crazy diverse amount of colleagues from around Europe and around the world. Um, and getting to sort of meet and network with people. And those experiences were huge. Um, and in those early days, uh, things like MAD, like the MAD Academy, when it was very, very first created, um, and it was basically in a muddy field, in a paddock on the river, on the sort of harbour side of Copenhagen in a circus tent. And it was a complete disaster. It was like, 
uh, raining and mud and like all the team were running around helping each other put it on like we had sort of no idea what we were doing but the, the sort of back then you know to a certain extent the local who's who and the world who's who of media and industry people were coming into Copenhagen and you know we all had to sort of like pull together to make this thing happen um, and then you know I guess year after year the you know putting on those mad symposiums together and being a part of those was something that was just so rewarding what makes great service are there sort of elements and aspects from your perspective that you can share with us it's one of those things that i think forever um i've tried to put words on and articulate and it's something that's very difficult to do i think a lot of it does come down to having a, a natural intuition and talent and desire to, uh, you know, want to understand people and take care of people. There's definitely certain parts of it that can be taught, um, but there's a big part of it that I think also needs to come naturally. Um, for me, it's about creating experiences for people and connecting with people. Um, and I think culturally, the best way and the first way to do that is with the team that you have. Um, you know, you can't rely on doing it all yourself. Um, it is all down to a, becoming a team effort, which was one of the reasons that I stayed where I was at Noma for so long because of the, I guess, the camaraderie between all departments, the the kitchen, the front of house. Um, and there was, look, there was definitely moments, but in general, um, you know, this sort of wall had broken down between the, the kitchen and the front of house, which traditionally you would find uh, to be a lot more adverse in, in sort of more traditional sort of fine dining high-end restaurants um, or any restaurants for that matter. Um, so I guess culturally that camaraderie between all departments that everyone was sort of like there for the right cause and the same cause service-wise ended up having a huge impact on, on the guests. And I think that, yeah, like I said, for me, that's what kept me there for so long is beyond the excitement and creativity of the food being so boundary pushing um, was the sort of the level of uh, care that we could give the guests. Staff briefing is quite vital before just about every service. What, what take us through a sort of staff briefing that you would deliver? How, how do you rile the troops for to excel so much in the service side of things? Yeah, I mean, staff briefing is. Um, I, I can't, <clears throat> I can't emphasise enough as to how important it is for me. It was more than the information that was shared. Um, when we would do briefing. Um, to me, it was about setting the tone for service or for the coming service, almost like a rally cry or like a pregame, um, you know, powwow. Um, I felt that it was a way to sort of set the energy, um, you know, both in, in an inspiring way to the team. I think that you know, it's so important to like make people feel good and inspire people before going into something that, you know, like service or a game, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, the briefing was an important moment. I mean, of course, it was the sharing of every single tiny little bit of detail as to, you know, uh, as much as we knew about the guests and where they were coming from and whether they'd been before and all of those sort of practical bits of information. But it was also a moment to touch on, you know, things that we were doing well and things that we wanted to work on and do better. Some briefings we would repeat the, the sort of the same problem day in, day out until we <laughs> managed to actually, you know, nail it and, and, and make it and, and improve and make it better, um, which was tedious. But again, it's pouring over all the details and briefing is a big one. For someone looking to have a long, fulfilling career in the front of house, what sort of ad advice would you have for them early on in their career? Well, unfortunately, it, I think that it's an industry that is maybe to start with saying that it's it's a struggling industry at the moment, obviously, for various reasons. Um, it's an industry that I do obviously feel very passionate about nurturing and um, 
I think that it can provide such um, a rich um, and exciting career path the, where it can take you, the people you can meet and the traveling opportunities. Um, for me, I think that like knowledge is power um, and I guess researching, reading and studying the history of what came before is so important um, and, and looking back and re- respecting those who did it before and have an understanding of the traditions and, and history of whether it be cooking styles and cuisines and techniques or, you know, um, chefs that, that, that sort of came before and then even more so looking into service styles and trying to discover also some of the iconic maitre d's of the world. And, um, yeah, I would just say, like, look back and – Arm yourself with as much knowledge and history as, as possible. You mentioned um, that you came back to Australia in 2022. You've been here a couple of years now. What, what did you? What brought you back here and what's it been like for you? Well, the hard part of that chat is based around um, the passing of my mother. Um, so with COVID, we had these years where um, obviously we couldn't come back and my parents couldn't come to visit, which originally, I mean, even being gone for 13 years, I came home every year to visit and always kept, you know, in touch back here and my parents would come every year. Um, But unfortunately, um, you know, like I said, my wife and I had thought about at one point with our kids moving back to Australia reconnecting with the family here and, you know, giving our kids a little bit of that lifestyle. So it was on the cards at some point, but what decided the move when we did it was that my mum got very sick and we realised that we had a very limited amount of time. So we we basically packed up our house within three weeks. Um, and so it was, a, it was a fairly turbulent move. Um, you know, after 13 years of being there, having to go to the team and to Renee and say, look, this is happening. I mean, I didn't need to explain it. The support was incredible and they just said, you need to just go. And um, so we got back and we got to have the couple of months with my mother um, before she passed. And, um, you know, like, it, we we definitely feel like it was, of course, the right decision and right thing to do um, for us and the kids. So that was the, the reason we came back um, when we did. And, um, yeah, so it was not necessarily the easiest transition back to Australia, not the one that we had dreamed of, um, bringing the family back to all be together. Um, so it did take some time to sort of get back into things here and find our way. Um, there's so many wonderful things about the lifestyle here, uh, but it was also a big change for us. There was a lot of things that we weren't used to, even though I'm from here. It had been so long that I'd, since I'd lived here. Um, so it was a big transition, and now we're just starting to feel actually um, <laughs> like settled in and comfortable and enjoying it and, and finding our place in the circle of you know friends and colleagues. Um, but, yeah, we've made the choice to head back to Europe for now. Not necessarily forever, but for now. Well, what are you looking forward to with the, with the new adventure and heading back to Europe? I mean, of course, I miss um, within Europe being able to, like, travel to the proximity of some of the, uh, you know, the other countries and enjoy the, the, the different cuisines and cultures that are so close by. I, I really love that. Um, and Copenhagen, I just love the lifestyle of – being able to get from point A to point B on a bicycle, um, not sitting behind the wheel of a car. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love taking a bit of a road trip here and getting behind the wheel, but the day-to-day, I just miss that, the the ease of jumping on a bike and the freedom of that feeling. Um, and, of course, like, you know, getting back to a city that I got to know so well um, and, you know, taking on uh, a big role now um, with one of the, the sort of the larger restaurant groups over there. Um, so I'm really exciting because I think that will be a, a, a totally different way of working and a big learning experience for me. Well, um, 
it's an absolute honor to have you on today. Um, you've influenced so many and had such an amazing career. Can't wait to see what you do over there um, next. Um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll have to catch up again soon. Yeah, that would be great. Appreciate you having me on, Huck. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.